Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm Dan, and this is the Having Initiative podcast. Today's episode is entitled Mental Health. Now, I know everyone and their mom is talking about this right now, and I think it is important when people talk about, you know, wanting to improve mental health, that kind of thing, and I do believe that we should do that. But like most of the topics that I've been talking about, I have some concerns about what is currently going on, and I think we should clarify a few things. And I think that a lot of people, regardless of their intentions, while they, like, again, some people I genuinely believe do want to make mental health better and address issues, that kind of thing, but I think their efforts are making things worse, at least in some cases. And I also think that it is becoming a buzzword. And I don't think I've I've gone into this yet in this podcast. But uh, for anyone listening, my definition of a buzzword is a word that at one point had meaning and it probably was important in some way. But people are throwing it around carelessly and without the right intention behind the, that original definition. And as a result, it is losing its meaning because it's just being used out of context everywhere all the time. And and I've also noticed that uh, words can have a good or bad connotation associated with them. And so if people want to puff up their arguments, they will just throw out a bunch of quote-unquote good-sounding buzzwords. And if they want to disparage someone or something, then they will throw out a bunch of bad buzzwords. So that's my buzzword definition. Now, with mental health, full disclosure... I have had my own experiences with needing to address things, and some of them could be said to be more extensive than what is considered normal. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Now, this, uh, this is actually my second time recording this because uh, I was I, the outline looked long. I tried to do it in one episode, but uh, there was issues, and also it does feel like it was talking by myself for over an hour. I don't know how many people are going to be into that. So I'm splitting this up into two episodes. Uh, things that I talk about in this episode, there's going to be recurring themes throughout, and I'll try to address that. And some of these things might overlap into the next episode because, again, they were meant to be one episode. So for today, part one, the chapters for this episode are too broad an application, treatment, and minor issues. So with that, let's get started. So I talked about too broad an application with mental health. The term mental health is, like I said, is being thrown around a lot. And that's causing problems. Now, with mental health, because I'm not entirely sure, that I believe is the kind of public term that's used, whereas the clinical terms will be, you know, something else. Now, that blanket term, mental health, it can cover severe issues. And something like that is, we have this phenomenon called PTSD. And a lot of people, when we look back at like World War II or earlier, uh, someone who had some of the symptoms of PTSD or experiences would be called shell-shocked. And so we use them as equivalents. Like, oh, uh, when we look about, when we read about World War II and hear that people were shell-shocked, we, they had PTSD. And before the term shell-shocked was used, I believe there was this term called railway spine. And again, when people look at what we call shell-shocked and then look at the people, the symptoms they had when we, they called them having railway spine, they just associate them as equivalents. And I think railway spine was around the time of World War I. And that, that was used to describe... A situation that would happen. So in World War I, uh, British soldiers and everyone were stuck in trenches for years at a time sometimes. And they were constantly getting shelled in an attempt to, you know, thin the ranks. And I had heard that there was, there had been some soldiers who had been there for so long, not moving, stuck in the trenches. They had been shelled over a million times. And yeah, that's, that's pretty intense. And some of them were shelled so badly that they just couldn't move. They weren't physically injured at all, but they were mentally traumatized and they couldn't move. 
And since we didn't have, you know, PTSD terminology, or I guess what we would call mental health concepts back then, it was just assumed that they were being cowards. That it was cowardice. They didn't want to fight, so they just pretended. And in war, I know with Britain at the time, that was an executable offense, and a pretty large number of uh, soldiers were who were traumatized and couldn't move were execute, executed because they thought it was cowardice. Now, um, yes, and that is terrible. But so when I'm talking about mental health, those are severe issues that are uh, obviously that was mental. It's a little tricky terming that mental health because when people are talking about mental health these days and improving it, they're normally not talking about that kind of situation. And r real quick before I move on, when we're looking back at the past, like, yes, that was a terrible thing. You know, they were serving and they weren't being cowards. They were just traumatized, but it was assumed that they were being cowards. Yeah, it's really easy to look back at that time, point in time and say those people were terrible for doing that. But again, they didn't know what we know now. And uh, as I get going, I'm going to say that maybe what we know now isn't as absolute as we give it credit for. So just something to bear in mind. But also, uh, and I think this will get fleshed out later, we railway spine was a thing and they started calling it shell shocked and people would look at the symptoms reported for both and as associate them as equivalents. And then shell shocked, we now call that PTSD, but PTSD has very specific criteria and not all of them apply to shell shocked. You know, some people that were shell shocked were had milder symptoms or more treatable than what we call PTSD. And a lot of them had much worse that it was probably be termed something else today. So looking back at history with mental health, it's, it's a little tricky, not just with diagnosis, but also with metrics, because our standards have changed frequently over the decades. So just something to bear in mind. So when I'm talking about how mental health, that term is a little too broad, uh, I mentioned severe issues like being shell-shocked. There's also smaller issues that are lumped in. Now, um, people talk about having anxiety and how that causes, you know, discomfort, and, you know, palpitations or a sense of fear, that kind of thing. But people can also have just nerves. And in my experience, nerves aren't classified as mental health, at least when the people that I see talking about it. But anxiety, that's something that's given much more. And at times when people describe their, again, this is in the common arena, not they weren't clinically diagnosed or anything. When they talk about their anxiety, some symptoms, yes, it sounds like that is they are going through something pretty heavy. But other times when they describe their symptoms, nerves would have been a more appropriate word. And then with anxiety, there are anxiety disorders, and those are pretty, they have a pretty big effect on your life. And as a result, you have to accommodate it much more. But other people, when they describe anxiety, like I have anxiety or I'm having anxiety, it's something that comes and goes. And the uh, with anxiety disorders, sometimes they will, you know, their intensity will come and go but they tend to be much more, you're kind of more stuck with them. And so all of these, you know, anxiety, nerves, anxiety disorders, or having anxiety, they're all kind of lumped together under this broad application of mental health. Also, like kind of like with nerves, there are, in my opinion, there's a lot of issues that are kind of experienced or behavioral, but it's on the kind of bottom end of the spectrum to where Maybe it is something regarding your head, but classifying it as mental health is almost giving it more, um, it's it's a disservice to the more serious things because it's giving credence to something small that can be more easily fixed with, you know, just basic adjustment in behavior. And the reason why I'm talking about the severe issues and the smaller issues getting lumped together and how that's kind of a problem, I mentioned that the smaller issues, giving them more credence is a disservice to the bigger one is because mental health does have a bit of a stigma attached to it in our society, at least at, at times. Now, I'm going to, let me explain. Uh, when we talk about stigmatization, there's, most people would say PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They are experiencing something and it's, the source can be attributed to some kind of trauma. And most people, 
will be sensitive to that because trauma is, you know, a bad thing. And as a result with something like PTSD, while some may have a stigma against it, there is a lot of support for, or at least there are calls to basically not view that as something to be afraid and to be more understanding. But I think where a lot of the stigma comes in with something like that, this specifically is that some behaviors that a person with PTSD is experiencing, some of those behaviors can to others seem a bit unpredictable and we don't like unpredictability. And so it makes us on edge. Now, another example is I'm not sure if autism is, if it would fall under mental health categorization. Again, this is when we're talking about in the common layman's terms, we probably would, but I don't know clinically. I've known a few people with autism and I, before I had met them, my experience with autism was, was always with movies and TV. And normally it was there. What was portrayed was, um, someone who would seem mentally challenged, unable to comprehend basic things, but oftentimes they would also portray them as being a savant, which I've heard with real Asperger's uh, syndrome is incredibly rare. And most people don't, but once I met a couple of people with autism, for the most part, like one or two of them, they just seem socially awkward a little. You wouldn't have thought that they had anything uh, quote unquote wrong with them. And then a couple more seemed very socially awkward. And um, they, if we were in a situation where there's a conversation going on, sometimes it felt like they were interjecting into the conversation for the sake of being in it, but not actually, they couldn't read the room well in terms of their, so it seemed very awkward. And it, depending on if, you know, I was busy or focused on something that was more or less annoying. But again, uh, for the most part, they didn't seem dangerous or unpredictable. And so uh, it, people, it, it would make sense, the arguments with people have about how we should destigmatize these things. Yeah, absolutely. They were not a harm to anyone. But there was one incident with one person that I knew who, uh, he was one of the more, more, I guess, he was one of the more extreme cases of autism. And because he was the most socially awkward, he didn't understand a lot of things. And the, it was difficult to have anything resembling a conversation with him because it would always branch off. And he had an incident where he, in a public place where there were potentially kids around, a lot of kids around, he broke down and just started screaming obscenities. And that caused some issues, but we mostly got them resolved. And... As again, I've heard about people talking about how we should be sensitive and understanding, and I do agree with that when we're talking about people with mental health, but and particularly on the autism spectrum. But I can't pretend that it's not a bit unnatural to be concerned when you witness something like that. And again, uh, parents are very protective of their children, and if they see a grown man shouting curse words really angrily. I can understand why they would be protective about that and not want him to be around. So that, uh, when I talk about PTSD and autism, again, I don't know if that's technically categorized under mental health, um, that those things, I can see why there is a stigma against mental health. And I'll, I'll give more examples later, but if you're trying to destigmatize the term mental health, whether it's for big issues or small issues, kind of lumping the big and the small together, like they counteract each other. Now, if, if most people, when they're talking about mental health, are, it, it won't affect anyone else. It'll just affect their life, like anxiety or whatnot. It will cause them to miss out on things or not want to do things. And so, okay, if we want people to address that, we need to destigmatize the term mental health. But since you're lumping in that lower level anxiety with something dramatic, like, you know, uh, what I mentioned just now, uh, it's going to be difficult because the one, the bigger one, the bigger issues are associated with the smaller ones. And so there's that natural tendency to be wary of that kind of behavior. And also, if you want to destigmatize the major ones, the smaller issues kind of 
like, oh, like uh, having occasional anxiety or nerves or something like that, the things that kind of come and go, associating that with the larger ones make it seem like the people with the larger ones, like there's an easy fix, why aren't they doing it? And so, as I said, most mental health isn't like the, when we categorize mental health, it's not like the extreme ends, but people I think are fearful of the term because it's heavy like that. So that's something to bear in mind with lumping them all together. Now I've been mentioning this throughout the, this episode thus far, and I'm going to talk about it now. There's the clinical science, quote unquote, scientific standards for mental health, the procedures and policies for how to diagnose and how to deal with them. And then there is our pop cultural zeitgeist about talking with mental health, mainstream news, YouTube videos, influencers on social media, that kind of thing. Invariably, whatever truth we can gather from the scientific or the clinical will get muddled up in some way in pop culture. And there, and so when we're talking about that, you know, mainstream TV or Instagram, there's a lot of stuff that is, again, well-intentioned, but it's kind of useless. And there may be useful stuff in there, but there's a lot of people who are self-adorned counselors or therapists or whatnot. And with some of them, their only qualification is that they are an empathetic person who wants to help people. And then with others, they may have some kind of official accreditation, but in my experience, not all therapists or accredited individuals are created equal. equal. And some of them were downright bad and shouldn't have been accredited. So that's something that's going to keep coming on throughout this episode and the next one, the difference between the scientific and the pop culture definitions of mental health and what to do about it now. And with the quote unquote scientific, just a quick tangent is that when you're in chemistry class or something like that, and you talk about how they measure uh, made experience experiments, my bad. And they would like take measurements. They would show how they could, okay, we can get a liter of this uh, element in a gaseous form. And then we could get a liter of that element in a gaseous form. And then we could weigh them with some atomic mass measurement or something like that. And then we can combine them together and then basically assess the products and see what chemical reaction occurred and how much of the products and the leftovers there are with the human mind. We don't quite have that. And so uh, my understanding was back when I was in college, I briefly dabbled in psychology and It was not in the natural sciences department. It was, I believe in the liberal arts because it, we don't have the same measures. And so there's a lot of interpretation and extrapolation when assessing mental health. So that's why when you hear me talk about the quote and quote scientific explanation, it's something to take with a grain of salt because it is hard to measure. Okay. So when we're talking about mental health treatment, obviously is something that comes up a lot. And there was a metaphor that was explained to me with treatment called the mom and dad approach. And the particular article that I was, that I first saw this in noted that female therapists tended to have the, to lean more towards the mom approach and the male therapists tended to lean more towards the dad approach. So this is how the metaphor was explained to me in terms of helping someone. Um, let's say a kid is playing hopscotch, they fall, uh, the mom approaches to run in there, say, are you okay? You know, check their injury, be very, you know, calming and oh, that kind of sweetie thing and say, let's go inside and patch you up. That was the metaphor for the mom approach. And the dad approach is kids playing hopscotch, they fall, dad runs in there, checks if they're okay, sees the injuries like, okay, this is not debilitating or whatnot. Uh, get up and try again. So that was the dad way of therapy or helping. And again, that's just a metaphor. There are plenty of moms and dads who don't follow those patterns. And same thing with therapists who don't fit the build. But a lot of, when we're talking about the cultural zeitgeist, a lot of what I'm seeing is the mom approach, which, and with that metaphor, someone said, okay, which is the better or more important way, the mom approach or the dad approach? And Typically, the quote-unquote correct answer that's given is that 
they both have their uses and they are both important at different times. Now, the kind of when and where to use them, that's a subject of constant debate. But the article said that the with therapy, the mom approach was becoming too predominant. And as a result, there was a stagnation in improving mental health. And we look at, and I was talking about like influencers on YouTube or Instagram, social media, that kind of thing. The mom approach is a bit too predominant. And again, it is important and it does have its uses, but with mental health, ultimately, like no one else except the individual can ultimately adjust. The dad approach is being neglected. It's not so much that the mom approach isn't important. And I kind of mentioned this in season one about how I think it was competition that there is this predominant idea that if we make people comfortable, they will rise up to their full potential because they won't be burdened by things and or fear, that kind of thing. And with mental health, the the predominant and that I've seen in the pop culture arena is all about making people more comfortable by saying like it's okay which again there is a place for that in particular if we're talking about trying to destigmatize things but it it's going on a bit too long and i do see like random posts that pop up that do mention that only you can change this or address this but there's this other tagline that comes along with it which is whenever you're ready and again, whenever you're ready is oftentimes a metaphor for whenever you're comfortable. And that's determined as uh, when you don't feel any anxiety at all. But whenever you face your issues, whether it's mental health or otherwise, there's going to be discomfort. It's like the, okay, kid, you skinned your knee playing hopscotch. You feel a little bit of pain, but you're able to keep going, keep hopping. And um, I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. And my personal experiences with mental health addressing the behavior or changing your thought process that's what brought about change and made things better and it was difficult at first and again when we're talking about making people comfortable something that's been thrown around a lot are trigger warnings and the people that are for them are saying you know there are people who have gone through difficult things and if we want to help them get better we have to protect them from the things that could trigger them and debilitate them. So if there is something that could potentially set them off, give them warning. And if they're not in a good state to handle that, they go do something else. And the people that argue against it, it's like um, when you have a house and you have a newborn running around, you put uh, outlet protectors on so they can't shock themselves. You take away all the knives so they can't cut themselves because they don't know any better. You baby proof the room and they're arguing with the, with trigger warnings that it's trying to baby proof the world but you can't do that but also not just for the sake of the individual who has mental health issues or could be triggered by it it's affecting everyone else now the counterpoint to that is oh, you should be compassionate to those who are suffering but the again and the counterpoint to that is that the world is difficult and if we really want to help them we have to get them to acclimate to the difficulty of the world and then of course there's the argument that by just acknowledging a trigger warning with certain content, you might be triggering the person regardless. So why not just go all in? And obviously there have been studies about the effectiveness of trigger warnings. Now, personally, the only ones that I've glanced at were saying that they weren't good. And I have to be honest that I have my own opinions and my own experiences, and perhaps that influences my willingness to view some studies as more credible. And, or just things that I see on the internet. So with that in mind, I would say with treatment of whether mom or dad, mom approach, dad approach, or whatever, and something in between of both of them, I would say maybe the big test for treatment is you ask yourself or you get the individual who's suffering to ask, what are your goals with this issue that you have? You know, do you want to be a nor quote unquote normal functioning individual of society? Do you want to be free of the anxiousness or the symptoms, that kind of thing? Find out what their goals are and make sure that they are something worth aspiring to. 
You know, I, I can understand if right now they're not ready for something, but their goal should be something that is good above them, better than their current state. So find out what their goal is and then ask yourself, is the treatment that they're going through bringing them closer to that? If they've been doing it for a while and they plateaued, that's something. And in the short term, it can be difficult to see. So something to bear in mind. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some minor issues. I, I kind of touched on this, and I think that, yes, there is a mental aspect of these. But again, lumping them in with mental health issues, at, at times it's giving them more by doing that, you're giving them more power than they deserve or should have. And in other times, you're kind of belittling the more extreme ends of the spectrum because these are a bit more easy to address. Uh, when we talk about like phobias or kind of just small issues that people have, again, it's not stopping them from living their life in a big way, but it's kind of it's something that, oh, I can't do that. or I'm not doing that kind of thing. Uh, one example is I knew someone who... Um, they were plenty smart, but they had issues speaking up, even in benign situations where there, it's low stakes, not a lot of tension, that kind of thing. And it, it just any amount of pushback from someone else could kind of, have, oh, oh, okay, I'll, I'll settle down kind of thing. And they just didn't like putting their opinion out there. And uh, eventually I found out with them that there was an experience when they were younger in like elementary school or something where they were in class and maybe they were misbehaving a little or they didn't quite know the answer. They were struggling in school and the teacher kind of just like made them stand up and talk out loud and then they ridiculed them in front of all of their peers. So yeah, that was a bit rough. And so after that, they were, he's, they said, since then, I've been afraid to talk in front of other people. And even if it's like low stakes or something, you are still putting your opinion out there and therefore making it available to scrutiny. And so, yeah, I can see why they, you know, had issues speaking up. And uh, that is obviously in their head. And some would say it was a trauma. I, I wasn't there, so I can't say how bad it is. But, you know, I've been publicly, small uh, in small and big ways, publicly humiliated. And there were various, took various lengths of time to get over those things. And, and one example with me is that um, I was at a, as a little kid at an event or something like that. And I threw up in front of a bunch of adults cause I, you know, wasn't good at talking yet and couldn't say I needed to do that. And I could feel all of their eyes on me. And so I kind of became a bit wary about throwing up in public. And what didn't make it worse was that when I was like in fifth grade, I was at a basketball game. I knew I was sick and it was coming up and I was telling the coach, like, get me out, get me out, sub me out because this is coming. He's like, yeah, yeah, well, we have a timeout in a few minutes. But uh, I didn't make it, and I puked in front of everyone. So that didn't help my fear of throwing up in public. Now, throwing up's not fun, but doing it in public was even worse. And that's what I feared even more. <laughs> so with those two situations, they, would, they were easily prevented, but at the same time, they were probably easily fixed. And a lot of, like, there's a stereotype with therapists saying, okay, tell me about your childhood and... It's almost a joke at this point, but I mean, yeah, a lot of issues do stem from maladaptive issues from quote unquote trauma in childhood. And I, I do see commentary on Instagram, but the, my issue with the addressing trauma is that at times it is blamed for everything. At times it is given a little too much. Whenever you're ready, you can address this. And at times there's a lot of baby proofing going on to fix it as like, okay, this is genuinely something that has, you know, hurt you. Uh, don't feel like you need to address it right now whenever you're ready and feel comfortable. Now, problem is, for the most part, that may never come. So with mental health, there's big issues and minor issues and they're being lumped together a little too well. And with treatment, there's a lot of pop psychology going on. That, and I think we need to examine, are these things helping? So just something to bear in mind. All right, everybody. Uh, that pretty much wraps up this episode. Yeah, it's a little on the short end, but I got a lot more to talk about. So thank you for listening. And this was part one again. And now it's time for a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you. Hey, everybody. 
thank you again for listening. Um, this was Mental Health Part 1, and it was tricky with planning this out because there was a lot of groundwork to cover, and so they kind of got split into two episodes. And in hindsight, with some of this, I'm there's a little more repetition than I would have liked, but at the same time, it might have been better to do it as one. But with this one, there was important things that I wanted to cover, particularly with the too broad application that people are throwing the the term around mental health a lot. And a lot of them for good intentions, but I do see problems arising from that approach. And of course, starting to talk about treatment was another big issue. So in the next episode, that's whenever I kind of go into the personal stories, whether they're mine or other people that inform what I talk about here. So if you haven't listened to that, I hope you tune in next week to check it out. So once again, everybody, thank you for listening. If you'd like to support this channel, please like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and share this video with anyone you think might be interested. And yeah, I hope to see you guys next week. Take care.